So um, one of these questions is talk about how your work relates influences new art activism like the degenderettes. Um, and I will I'll jump in and just share that um, I um, the a lot of the works that I do um, uh, there's documentation work I did a, a short on Teresita la Campesina called Wanted Alive. Um, in 96, I, I also did a movie called Viva 16, Viva 16th in 1994 with Augie Robles. And gender and sexuality are at the forefront. For me, as a genderqueer person, before the concept of genderqueer was out there, um, uh, like my friend Osa had, uh, was working on a movie. When it went, that's how we actually met. Lenore and I have known each other for three 30 years, I think. something like that, a long time. And uh, also I recently shared a photo of me that's on the flyer that Mason used um, where I was using lips. I just always had, I used lipstick a lot. And sometimes people would ask, you know, like, what is, what's up? Or maybe they wouldn't ask, they didn't really say. But um, what I, how I connect today's gender activism and the degenderates in particular to that work uh, or to that time is that um, we were really creating our own spaces and we were creating our own identities. And in, in some cases, people like Teresita, um, Chili D, Virginia, Benavides, like we kind of um, challenged gender in our own ways in, on a daily basis. And we resisted labels. So, like, uh, I'm going through digitized video of Teresita right now. And uh, I asked her, when did she first start doing drag? And she didn't correct me, but her response said, I first started dressing up um, when I was 16. And um, what she goes on to share is that she is not trans, that she um, is a man and a woman. And... It's really something that I relate to. And I think the degen, um, degenderates, I think what um, Mason and the Hormel Center are putting out there in terms of questioning gender, um, I, it really relates to me because I think sometimes people really are into the labels and categories and forcing our stories in ways that don't allow us to tell our own stories. Well, those were just some from the audience. If you if you wanted to answer any of those, and then there's some other ones that I have too. Either way. Okay. Um, this actually could relate to uh, Valentine's as well. Uh, my question here is, how did you they experience slash overcome or reconcile challenges in the development of subject slash work? Um, <clears throat> In terms of my own work, that I, my body of work that I've developed over the years, um, uh, one of the strategies that I used uh, uh, when I realized that it was uh, pretty difficult as a woman and as a person of color, later as a queer person, to get work that I might be interested in doing into quote unquote mainstream galleries, um, I learned very quickly that for all the talk that I used to hear all the buzzwords about how avant-garde they were. The reality is that there were certain barriers in terms of content that you couldn't get your way into these spaces with a shoehorn. I mean, that's just the reality. You could submit as many slides. Back in the day, there were slides. Uh, you know, it, but it, it would just be completely ignored. I did manage to get some of my work into juried competitions locally, regionally, and around the country. Sometimes I would get some into uh, places that would um, uh, have a call for artists' work that had to do with families. Uh, but And sometimes I would get into them. Uh, but the challenges that I would sometimes be faced or would hear about later is somebody would write in the comments of the books that were laid out, uh, particularly in uh, places like in Concord or uh, you know, across the bay somewhere, uh, why did you include this piece? 
Like, for instance, the piece I showed of John Arbuckle and his then partner who died with their cat, that had to be moved from a place where it was installed. And that particular show had to do with Anne Frank. And, and the curator, his intent was to broaden the topic of uh, tolerance, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so this particular spot, it was like a, like a pop-up gallery kind of place in a shopping center in Corte Madera. Well, the, the location of the painting then could be seen through the windows. And there were some objections to its inclusion. And so as not to have a lot of pushback, they just moved it to be less visible. And I only found out about it when I went to pick up my painting after the show was over, uh -huh. and some of the artists saw me coming through with my painting in the parking lot, and they said, oh, how did you handle that one? And I had no idea what had happened. Wow. Another, another case was over at, um, in Concord, there's a, I can't remember the name of the gallery, but it's over in Walnut Creek, that area. And I had a painting, it was a domestic scene of two women in a kitchen. They were partners at the time, and they were just, you know, over a kitchen stove. And that, was, again, was part of family uh, theme. And somebody objected to that as well. So I've had those kinds of things in, quote, unquote, mainstream venues. But on top of that, I was also getting my work out there through, you know, um, uh, nonprofit community organizations. I, I've shown in a number of places all over the Bay Area. Um, at the South Market Cultural Center, Mission Cultural Center, you know, just about every cultural center in the city. So I've got my work out there that way. And the other thing uh, that I began to learn through my politics and grassroots work is to create your own community. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I was part of a number of organizations like the Asian American Women Artists Association, and I was a, a board member uh, and founding board member of QCC and, and its president for some 13 years. And so we started reaching out to the cultural centers in the Bay Area, in the in the city, pooling our resources. Um, sometimes some of us would have grant expertise, or we knew how to put a show together, or something like that. Other people had a venue. We were always a virtual cultural center. So those were the kinds of things that we developed to create a network and an infrastructure in a day when uh, you couldn't necessarily get your work out there easily. Um, I think was the question, that one. Okay, I uh, like the work and being influenced with the new art and activism. I want to give credit to uh, Natalia Vigil, who's been doing still here. I like thank you to her and um, Christina Mitra, who started that with her. They both, they started it and I think for five years they did it together and then uh, Christina back. A step down. <clears throat> so I've been able, I was able to participate and still here twice with them. And I actually wrote to them. I submitted my work when I was still living in New Mexico because I was, and somebody said, you should apply to this. I was like, sounds great. So I applied from New Mexico. They're like, sorry, but we want people who are living here. And I was like, all right, okay. And then when I came back, they, they um, again, accepted me two times. And it's thankfully through them, I've been able to connect with, uh, with them and some younger artists, including Mason, a couple other folks, but um, it is harder at this time. I'm older, <laughs> you know, I'm a full-time teacher up in Sacramento. I have a five-year-old son, and those two, you know, the son comes first and last, and then the job, and then have a partner, you know? So it's hard to, um, you know, it's hard to find time to write my own stuff, let alone connect with other people. So I try to run down to the bay um, when I can. Um, again, donate some money. So uh, again, so I'm, I wish I could say I had a lot more to list, but uh, thank you to still here. And um, yeah. Thank you. So I had a number of questions that I had already prepared, but it seems like you kind of answered the first one about um, activism and your work and how they are they mutually enriching or how do they inform each other? And so I was gonna just skip to the next one and then, okay. So the next question was, um, 
Often as artists and activists with many identities, we navigate many worlds. This requires a journey through insider and outsider perspectives. Can you say something about this navigation or does this not resonate with you? Yeah, I think, um, I think as you saw in my slides, I started off with uh, my family's place at, on 18th Street. And I feel like insider, outsider, is, if it, it's like I was born in, I was born in Kaiser, not in the mission, but born in San Francisco. <laughs> um, it's true. Um, so I grew up in the mission, but it was like, kind of like parallel universes. There's like my family, and then there's this whole other world. And, it, and it's the whole other world. We're very insular, very insulated. We had so many cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents all in the same house every night for dinner that we didn't, and they kept, and a lot of us were girls, so I think they kept a close eye on us in a way, like, and we grew up here, and, and the adults um, who took care of us, they didn't walk around the world like, yeah, this is my world. That's why I didn't, I didn't really feel that. They were like, be careful, and so I feel like that's my first insider outsider was our family and that everybody else, and then there's, um, you know, again, being queer, it's like, well, I see all these, I see the neighborhood changing where my Uncle Joe used to live on Castro Street and it was just Castro Street and now it's the Castro. So there is that thing and then there's um, class and, you know, and then there's academia. And um, one thing I, about academia is that as I, you know, started going up in uh, the, you know, levels, um, I didn't want to lose my family and that's, has to do with partly, you know, my mother dying in my second semester of my first year of college, and I was very close to her family, um, and I wanted to maintain that closeness, and I wanted to stay in school, but I, I didn't, I could, I heard, I didn't just, it wasn't just my imagination, but, you know, with Richard Rodriguez, is one of the Chicanos out there, American-Americans, who's saying, education made me separate myself, and I knew I didn't want that separation, so I... I would share what I was learning with my family. And, and also academia was a weird thing to me. I'm like, wow, I mean, because I went there in, as a high school student at these uh, summer trips, summer, summer programs. And I remember discovering this thing called the bagel. I was like, whoa, what's that? You know, and it was like <laughs> cream cheese. And I'm like, I don't like cream cheese. I like bagels. But it was this whole other world. But I, I knew I didn't want it cut off. And, and it has taken work. You, any other thoughts? I think um, Vero, Vero Mahano and I had a conversation uh, about a couple of months ago uh, that I think is connected to this in that like 24th Street, uh, there's the Mission Latino Cultural District that's out now. And, um, but Vero and I, Vero works at Cap St uh, Mission Neighborhood Center on uh, Cap. And a lot of my work revolves around 16th Street and like love, life, death, crime, um, everything on 16th Street. And we were talking about how they're so different, how 24th Street and 16th Street are so different. And ultimately what she said was, oh, 16th Street is shady. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? And she is like, 16th Street is very shady, whereas 24th Street is kind of like more respectable now. And I was like, oh, okay, yes. 16th Street is shady and it's still shady. And how I relate it to this is that we are outsiders. That I I can walk uh, on 24th Street. I work, Shanti and has an office on 23rd between South Venice and Folsom. Uh, but I feel more, I'm an outsider when I go to that part of the mission. Whereas on 16th Street, they're like, hey girl, like, <laughs> Where you been? I haven't seen you for a long time. <laughs> and that's for real, because there's still a lot of us still live there. Like Mahogany grew up, uh, was raised on 16th Street. And um, Teresita lived at Mich the Mission Hotel at 16th and South Venice. And uh, little Lulu, who passed away a drag queen, lived around the corner from me. She committed suicide on Valentine's Day in like 88. And a whole bunch of us, like uh, or, uh, 16th Street is that. 
like we are that and like our blood is on that street our our lives are, are on that street and we are outsiders but we're not outside when we're on 16th street mm. thank you mm. there's something oh just real briefly sort of um I, I was actually kind of having a little flashback uh, because um i didn't grow up in the mission i grew up on the other side of the city uh in the richmond district and um, my dad tried to buy a house down the peninsula, and uh, he lost money in the venture because he was basically run out of town before we arrived. Mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, 1951. And so when, when he decided, okay, we can't, we can't get a house there, he was trying to get the family out of Chinatown. I never lived in Chinatown, but... I was born at St. Francis Hospital. We lived kind of near there for until I was two. So um, anyway, he tried in the Richmond District, which in those days was not like it is now. If you if you know the Richmond District, it's it's now it's like highly Asian mm -hmm. of all sorts, you know. But it took decades to get there, and and the newer people who moved out there since then have no idea what happened uh, when my dad brought the family out there. Uh, I learned as an adult that there were death threats. And when my dad bought the house through a third party so that he could kind of slip in there, um, they, they got the threats. Mm -hmm. And the real estate agent told him, you better put a two by four behind your garage door just in case. People wouldn't think of that now. I mean, people think that San Francisco is a liberal city. Well, I know. it's not. <laughs> it never really has been. But back in that day, it was worse, and it was very blatant. And unfortunately, some of this stuff is coming out again. Mm -hmm. Because, like, for instance, um, a little segue, I was in Japantown to, to go to a movie, and, um, and I had to use a pass you know, so I had to talk to a person. I couldn't use their kiosk. Well, I'd been standing around. The doors weren't open yet. And some, some guy comes up behind me, and, and he objected. He thought that somehow I had cut in line. There was no line when I come, came in. It was a white guy, and he said, you know, goddamn Asians. You know, in San Francisco, in Japantown, of all places, right? But unfortunately, in today's climate, it has become prevalent, and I'm hearing things as an adult that I haven't heard since I was in elementary school. So getting back to the, the question about inside-outside, when I was in the Richmond District growing up, I was always an outsider, but I didn't know that at the time. I thought that was normal. That was my normal, you know? And then as I got a little older, then, then I you know, learned a little bit more about all these different uh, barriers. I never understood why whenever I went to the supermarket, that's when they went to take a break, right? And, and then I realized, oh, they just don't want to serve me. So, you know, those are the kind of flashbacks I had. But yet, I would go down to the, the Fillmore or whatever with my black high school friends and have no problem, none. They were all, black people were always my protectors. And when I was little, my closest friends were Japanese Americans or Jewish, you know? And it, it, later I realized it, because it was because we had something in common. Mm -hmm. So as I became an adult, because of my family's influence and my dad, who was very worldly, he was a mathematician, and he had friends of all kinds and he worked with them, I learned to have a, a, a more open idea of the world and so I've always felt comfortable moving in different neighborhoods and with different cultures largely because of my friends mm -hmm. so you know that that was just sort of my experience thank you Lord. do you guys want to answer that question about hatefulness yeah oh, okay <laughs> it seems like a good segue yeah um it's like how have you coped with hateful hateful hatefulness any encouragement for younger folks? Um, like this is, yeah, the insider outsider. And, you know, part of the thing about uh, growing up in the mission and seeing part of it become the Castro, um, it's been kind of weird because the mission's home, um, but there were times when, as I started coming out, um, felt safer in the Castro, but then Later, it was like, oh, yeah, I really am, like, safer in a way in the Castro, but 
these big white guys are just bumping into me and kind of run me over here. Um, and I say, uh, you know, I, I love the mission. It's, it's, I love it. And, but I have to say, I, it's the place that um, it's been the hardest at times to be out. I mean, not just in Galeria de la Raza, which just feels like uh, um, home, you know, but like walking the streets and just being out. And I, I mean, I've been harassed on the street. I've been chased on the street. Um, besides, you know, verbally cussed out or yelled at. Um, and I say, and one of the people who yelled at me, I'm sorry, it was a little old lady. And all she, she was like, she saw me, she goes, lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I mean, if she'd been nice, I would have helped her with her groceries, but you know, I was like, it's like, you know, and so, but you know, it's been, it's been men, you know, it's I really who have been harassing and it's like, I'm with my girlfriend, you're alone, I don't know, you know, I'm just doing my thing. And um, it was somebody, you know, it's been, so how do we deal with it? Uh, most thankfully, I don't know if it's as age or what, but it hasn't happened in a while, but I'm a, because uh, it has happened multiple times in multiple places, and not just here, but in other places too. Um, yeah, I was just like, uh, Wear comfortable shoes. Be ready at any. I try to be ready for anything. Really, that's re that's real. Yeah. Um, try to talk. You know, again, it hasn't happened in a while, so thankfully, I'm I'm a little rusty on it. But um, I don't think um, it's never going to happen again. I know it can happen. I know that, um, and I I don't like that. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's what I have to say for right now. I um. Well, I take um, from like situations where there's openly, uh, there's hatefulness that comes out is um, know your worth and find people, uh, who, not necessarily who are like you, but who are, who are your partners in crime. And <laughs> because sometimes that's what it comes down to, uh, like, you know, you got to have, uh, this is... Life is short, and you're here for a little while. Be fabulous. Be brilliant. And if your form of brilliance bothers somebody, fuck them. And this is not for them. This is not for... The way I look at it is um, I wake up in the morning, and this is for me. And uh, this street is my street, or this moment is my moment. And these sisters, these people, my brothers, they're we're here for each other and everybody else they can do their thing and if they're so bothered with us fuck them this is um this is a moment in time where you should own it and what i learned from my like drag queen friends or my druggy friends or my ho poet hippie friends is you know what live your moment because we may not be here tomorrow and but hopefully we are tomorrow and but god damn it be fierce at least and if somebody can't take that level they should move to concord <laughs> they, uh, out of california this, this is it wait, wait. one thing i i, I want to say is that about the hateful um part is that i am um, when I moved back from Iowa, and I had, again, I'd been my family had been evicted in 1983, so those are new when I came back from Iowa in '98. Um, but the gentrification, I mean, it was just, you know, oh, you know, it was just I felt I felt I think more empowered, so I felt angrier, and um, and actually I was one of those hateful people on the street, and I would see somebody who I thought was an outsider, who I thought was a gentrifier, and I did not physically hurt anybody, but I would purposefully um, scowl, you know, look upset, and, and, um, and I would spit with disgust near them, not at them, <clears throat> but I, I, I didn't know how to fight back. That, you know, uh, you, you know that's, that's true. Um, and I, and I, but I realized is that my hatred, my anger was just hurting me. They were still living their little lives, and you know, there nobody was doing anything because of my little anger. <clears throat> and I was like, "Well, okay, let me go back to writing. Let me go back, you know, like let me let me channel this." So, 
have anything to add? Mm -hmm. Not really, except that I, I, I agree with Kathy, you know, because like the fellow who, who had a problem with me being in, at the Kabuki, I just turned around and said, you have a problem with it? And I just ignored him after that. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing he could do, mm -hmm. you know, because otherwise they're just wasting your energy. Thank you. Um, so we have two more questions that um, came from the audience. And I'm just going to read them. And then if you have any thoughts on either of them, um, just in the last 10 minutes or so here. How do you feel you can speak, or, or how do you feel, or can you speak of the difficulty, if any, in sharing space with queer youth today, for example, with language? And how do you feel like white supremacy slash academia still controls or dominates social slash political agendas regarding LGBTQ communities? What can we do? So um, if, it, if it's okay, I'll kind of jump in. I worked at Lyric um, La uh, Lavender Youth Recreation and Information Center for about six years. And um, I guess what I, um, what I learned there, um, or what I learned in other contexts that I, I took there and got reinforced was that um, the oppression that's occurring externally um, that we're able to make spaces and projects and art that supersede those things. And that uh, in the process, like sometimes people will talk about uh, um, working toward a revolution and waiting for that revolution for the utopia that we want. And I don't believe in that at all. Mm -hmm. what, I, what I think is um, enact your utopia today. But, and, and what I learned being at Lyric was be intentional, like talk about your boundaries and talk about what works for you and what we're gonna do, what, how we're gonna do it and hold each other accountable that we're, and also we deserve high quality things. We deserve high quality programs and art and fabulosity and that really takes a, a little bit of extra work. And in the process, our oppressions pop up and we act out against each other. And that's not okay. It's understandable, but it's not okay that we perpetuate those things or that we mimic those systems of oppression. So what I take away is um, acknowledge where people are at, what they've experienced, and to not let people stay there, that if, at least not with you in that moment. Like if they're after they're working with you uh, outside of that project, outside of that space, if they need to devolve back into whatever they were right beforehand, that's okay. But when they're with you, hold your hold your sister accountable, hold yourself accountable, and and um, and know that we're human and flawed, and that sometimes um, even the best of us monsters need a break, some slack, and need to cry. <laughs> I, I was just thinking about um, Katie Gilmartin, who um, runs the Queer Ancestors Project. Um, she's based at SOMARTS, and, uh, and now she's one of the sisters. And I love her when she's in that sort of incarnation. Uh, but one time she invited me to come to one of her print workshops where she was, um, you know, sort of assisting some young people in how to create uh, prints. And... Um, and when she reached out to me, uh, you know, sometimes I forget just how old I am mm -hmm. <laughs> at this point uh, because my mind hasn't changed, you know. <laughs> I just don't rise up as fast, you know. <laughs> but, but one of the things that I found interesting and I try to, to sort of impart when I talk to cal college campus classes and things like that, um, we don't have all the answers by any stretch. Uh, and so it's a learning curve for us as well. But I think one of the things that um, young people look for is encouragement. You know, they're trying to figure out their own lives and, and how they're going to carve out their niche 
And um, I think the thing that resonates the most is that they each have to find their own passion, whatever that is, there, there's no formula. And uh, if they have a, a strong interest in something, don't let it go. Because um, there's a lot of people that we encounter throughout our lives, and we all have, I'm sure, where somebody says, oh, no, you can't do that. You know, that's not what, what's being done, or that's not what's current, or whatever that's not popular, or like some people used to say, well, why are you doing work you know, uh, based on your culture or your you know, whatever? Uh, why don't you do this or that? You'd make more money. You'd, you know, why don't you do universal themes? Well, mm -hmm. like with my work, that is my universal theme because I come from my own cultural perspective, and so that's what my, my subjects are about. They're not about somebody else's lives, Unless, unless we collaborate on a project or whatever. So for young people who are just starting out in, in their art production or whatever it is that they're going to, to do with their lives, uh, I think it's, you just have to encourage them to find that. And it, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, but also to find people with like minds and interests because that's where you'll be the strongest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, one of the earlier questions is, was, is everything going to be okay? So I think we kind of answer this together, and it's like, well, well, yes and no. I mean, um, we, you know, our history, you know, I'm, I was glad how you began this by opening up and acknowledging we're on native land, you know, um, that's, that's huge. Um, our, the history of our country is a violent history. It's racist. It's anti-women, it's an, you know, anti-child, it's anti-so much. Um, so it's a hard time, definitely, believe me. Um, I, f I feel bad, like, God, I thought I was going to leave something better and easier for you all, and younger people, I was like, yee, um, <laughs> like, sorry. But uh, I really, you know, it's, I really do feel that, like, I thought, I thought we were progressing forward, even though we're having some steps back, so okay. Um, but the thing is, not the thing is, but one thing is we, we, we have the moment. I mean, you know, what you're saying, Valentina, is right, is that all we, and the North, like, all we have is ourselves and, and, and whoever our people are. And sometimes it's the family we're born into and outsiders. Sometimes it's not our family we're born into and it's other people. But we have, I, I don't, one thing is I don't, don't try to do anything alone. You know, I, I really try to um, show in this, you know, seeing different names keep popping up mm -hmm. and places. It's like, go to what sustains you, supports you, encourages you, like how I ended. And, um, and, and, and find those people that you can ask those questions, whatever you need to ask, and say what you don't know, you know? And, and instead of sometimes we try to act like we know everything and we don't have any questions and we have just the answers and we're going to do that. And it's great to have goals, but uh, life is not linear, you know, and we make mistakes and we make, and not only do we make mistakes, but sometimes we mess up on purpose. We do bad things, you know, we're human and we have jealousy and anger and pain and we act out in bad ways. And um, I'd say try to learn from it. Try to learn from it and try to, uh, you know, apologize as we need to. Um, you know, ask forgiveness. You know, you may not get it. You may not, you know, and we have to live with it. And I, you know, speaking from experience here. Um, and keep doing your art, whatever it is. And so, I know, believe me, I this book came out 20 years after it should have. And it's, I, I love it what it is. But man, I think about if I had put out an earlier version. Oh well, can't, we can't beat ourselves up forever. So do follow your passion, whatever that is. And um, writing, dance, painting, walking, gardening, cooking, all of that, building houses and, and teach. And you don't, have to, you don't have to teach in a school. I teach in a community college. I have a lot of friends who teach in a university. And I'm a professor, but I'm more of a teacher. My title is professor, but I'm a teacher. I taught high school, I taught in um, community arts organizations, and I'm so glad, and I feel like I'm so sorry. I'm such a better teacher now than I was, but um, <coughs> I wish I was this good then. But uh, you know, learn again, learn from it, and um, 
and, and, you know, take time. You know, sometimes we get to work, 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 work. It's great to work. It's important to work, of course. Um, but, if, and, you know, we've got to live hard, um, play hard, all that stuff. That's my answer. <laughs> thank you. Um, we just have a couple more minutes before the end, but I just wanted to thank you all for coming and talking about your work and your lives. And if, I, I didn't really, yeah. So I just remembered, I meant to say this at the beginning, but um, I do have copies of the books if anybody wants to buy them. Yeah, <laughs> cool. Uh, any other, we need a copy for the library of, well, we have Mission, Salvation on Mission Street, but the um, other one, we've been trying to get it in for like three months. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Okay. But anyway. I, uh, if I can add just one little yeah. thing is in, in terms of um, maybe the question, like, are we going to be okay? And also um, youth and sort of looking at like, I don't know, uh, a path. And um, just one thing that I'll share is... Um, that like to be literal, we're still here. The people who are of the generations, like my generation, other generations before me, like we're still here. And the idea that we're these separate islands is not real. And the idea that our projects and that our art and that our work is separate is not true. Um, it, instead, what I would say is connect with us. That we're not, um, we're here, and so I do love that people, younger generations are tapping into history, and then they come up with these um, weird versions of what happened. <laughs> it's really Wait, awesome. Can you give an example? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can. So I was a part of Ch La Chica Boom's walking tour in the Mission Displacement Tour, which is awesome, and I love La Chica Boom. And um, what happened was that was a follow-up kind of to a walking tour that I co-led through Radar Productions that was uh, organized by Juliana Lopera. And she's fabulous. And um, a, a, But La Chica Boom's walking tour, we had we went to the mission and they were like closed bars. And so um, my stop was we, they, she did a remix of v, a clip of Viva 16th. And, uh, and we went to like um, Amelia's and the Lexington and, and she's a performance artist and she's fucking weird and that's awesome. I don't say that in any, any bad way at all. She's completely fucking awesome. But what she did was she took the clip of Viva 16, remixed it and put this weird, sad, spooky cumbia song over it. <laughs> And did this dance, and it was really nasty. And she was like humping the walls, and she was like, it was it was tripped out shit, and and not at all history. Like it's not didactic. It's not. It was not like you know I'm gonna teach you about history, snor. But instead, she was like, I'm gonna have sex with history right here, and it's in my vagina, and it's gonna get nasty and wet, and it was completely awesome. Wow, it was really, really great. And and some of us were like Augie Robles, my sister was there and, and Loris and some others. And we had a great time. It was not at all our history though. So, I mean, it was connected to the site of Esta Noche. Most of the people who were doing that art had never been in Esta Noche, they were too young. And, and if they were there, they weren't there in the way that like Esther and I would hang out at La India Bonita. <laughs> and, and like, so like, if, like when we see something like La Ch what La Chica Boom did, it's kind of like, okay. So <laughs> what I would say is do your thing, do your tripped out weird ass shit and also connect with us because we were here and it's not like people have these narratives that we're all dead or that we're like they they sold our mouths shut or we can't make fabulous art anymore fuck that shit connect <laughs> with somebody from that time and say what what happened what was it like the stories are not linear they're not clean but you, what in the process you will do is um, actually connect with history and beyond what you're imagining what it was because that's it's cool and trippy and fun but it, it's not really connected to what happened at Amelia's or it's not really connected to what happened uh, at different periods of our lives. Thank I you. think 
And finally, I think everything, it, is it going to be okay? Yes. But um, I like this connection. Communication is about contributing to the conversation. So sometimes I um, seem to think, you'd, like, and you don't have to know everything. You don't have to um, be, uh, lack of confidence. It's like, it's just, sometimes our ego gets in the way. Like, and I think, and I say that because sometimes people are like, too big of ego, and sometimes it's too small of an ego. But it's like, just, just do it. Just do it. Put the ego aside. Just do it. And you're going to get the connection and, and be part of the conversation. And like, like you said, like, that's, that's a great creation. It's not what the original is, but that's, that's what we're all doing. We're all doing our own thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any I remember Estenoche and the flying beer bottles. <laughs> <laughs> I was there. I, I would say in terms of like, is it going to be okay, is a better question is, what am I doing today to make today better? And, uh, and that's it. You know what? And then do the, wake up and do the same thing the next day. Mm -hmm. And everything else, if we're, the world blows up, you can't help that. Or Trump does whatever, you can't help that. But you can know like 10 years, down, 10 years later from today, did I, did I work my ass off? And did I make the world better? Did I laugh? Did I create really great art? Mm -hmm. did, did I help? And did I help people on a daily basis? The answer should be yes. Then you're okay. Thank you.